Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, the show that is part of the Simply Luxurious Life online destination, cultivating true contentment, the art of living a life of quality over quantity. Visit the blog, The Simply Luxurious Life, at our simplified URL, tsll.co, or thesimplyluxuriouslife.com to find the show notes for each podcast episode, as well as much more weekly content to elevate your everyday and deepen your contentment. From a Monday motivational post, recipes, videos of the cooking show series, style and decor inspiration, French and British inspired content, and reader's favorite regular weekly post, This and That, which is posted each Friday morning. Now to today's episode. Welcome to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. I'm your host, Shannon Abels. And whether you're listening on your commute, exercising, working in the garden, or sitting down with a hot cup of tea or a cafe au lait, thank you for tuning in. Let's get started. Welcome to the 379th episode of The Simple Sophisticate. Today we're going to talk about being your own best friend, how to do that, and why it is one of the best, if not the best gift you can give yourself for your entire life. So the sooner we do it, if we haven't already done it, the better. All right. And before we get to that, I have 16 points actually I want to share with you on that topic. But before we get to the topic of our episode today, I have a petit plaisir that is going to take us to France and is also going to be for those who love history. I will share with you exactly what that is and why I think you might enjoy it at the end of today's episode. But now to our topic. So I want to begin with a quote from the book that inspired today's episode, How and Why to Be Your Own Best Friend. Let's begin with that. Quote, we are not born with the secret of how to live well, and too many of us never learn it. There is nothing cold-blooded or mechanical about it, but there are many things we have to learn to do. The first thing is to realize we've probably been looking in the wrong place. The source is not outside of us. It is within. End quote. From Mildred Newman and Bernard Berkowitz, authors of How to Be Your Own Best Friend. So to befriend ourselves, when we do this, we have a friend for life. This is a simple saying, and and no doubt many of us have heard it before. And it is true, but it is often, as this quote suggests, not understood as to how that can be possible. But the most awesome news I want to share with you today is that you have the answers to so much of the peace calm and clarity you have been seeking as it has been traveling within you this entire time. So how to tap into and what exactly are we looking for when it comes to being our own best friend? That is what we're going to talk about today. So this was inspired, as I mentioned, by the book, um, How to Be Your Own Best Friend. And it was originally written uh, and first self-published in 1971 by a married couple, Mildred Newman, and her husband, uh, Bernard Berkowitz, who were um, psychologists. And the original title was How to Be Your Own Best Friend, A Conversation with Two Psychoanalysts. Now, this book is small. It consists only of 74 pages. Their insights are shared, um, as this title suggests, in a conversation form. So there's questions followed by answers. So when they published this book, it was little known. They were not well known at that point. And then it came across the path of author, director, and 
and screenwriter Nora Ephron, who you may remember was behind When Harry Met Sally, um, Heartburn, um, Sleepless in Seattle, uh, You've Got Mail, all those movies that so many of us um, cozy in and watch. She re- read the book and she really liked it. And so she introduced it or the authors in the book to her literary agent. And then it became a national bestseller. Um, I've linked the post or the article that shares exactly how this happened. It was uh, written about recently again. Um, and it was just fascinating how just word of mouth, having it cross her path, and then the work spoke for itself. This a short book, but a very insightful book. So I picked up my own copy. I zoomed through it. And I found common sense advice grounded in approachable guidance from experts, sharing reminders and nudges of how we can help ourselves out, but often are too timid um, or unsure of how to do it due to a variety of cultural circumstances and or pressures. And as I was reading this book, there was an overlap that immediately became clear to me with regards to choosing to be your own best friend and then finding and experiencing contentment. And having just wrapped up the production of all the lessons of the upcoming Contentment Masterclass course, what you will discover when you enroll in the class is that knowing ourselves and honoring what we find to be true for ourselves resides at the core of living a fulfilling life. But often we just don't know how to do this. We don't know what that means, getting to know ourselves. And in this case, being our best friend, our own best friend. So in the words of the author, becoming our best friend is sage wisdom to follow. However, what does that look like, being our own best friend? That is what I'm gonna share with you today and the benefits of doing so. So let's get started. Number one. Stop waiting to live fully. Quote, we will continue to operate way below capacity of being happy if we continue to look for someone to give us the key to the kingdom, in this case, the kingdom referring to being happy. We must realize that the kingdom is within us. We already have the key. It's as if we are waiting for permission to start living fully. But the only person who can give us permission is ourselves. We are accountable only to ourselves for what happens to us in our lives. We must realize that we have a choice. We are responsible for our own good time. And this is a great place to start because often we we will sit down or we'll live our lives and we'll go, I can't do that until, or when, when this happens, then I'll be happy. That's the common phrase. When this happens, when I reach that goal, when I step into that relationship, when I get out of that relationship, when I finish this job, when I retire, when I graduate, whatever it is, then I'll be happy. But this is backward thinking. The goals, when they're reached, they're not going to be bad. It's not going to be a bad experience. It's going to be a lovely experience, but they're going to be even more amazing because we've been enjoying our lives leading up to that point. And while that euphoric moment of completion will be temporary, our constant state of enjoying our lives, of savoring every day, is what makes our life rich, what makes it a a pleasure and an amazing, awesome experience to live. And so how do we do that is by getting out of our own way, is by befriending ourselves. So that takes us to number two nourish ourselves rather than deplete or criticize ourselves. Quote, if you decide you want to help yourself, you can choose to do the things that make you feel good about yourself instead of the things that make you feel terrible. Now, easier said than done, many listeners are probably saying as they hear that quote. But the point here is we often do things that in the moment might feel really good, but then later we regret. Or we don't even enjoy it in the moment, but we feel we have to be doing it. There's some kind of should that's directing us. And that should can come from anywhere. So I'm not just going to share one or two examples of that because it can come from anywhere. Once we understand why we're making the decisions we are making, we become more in tune with who we are. We understand the influences we have allowed to come into our lives. And we start to make different and thus better choices. 
When we understand what we need, this is part of that getting to know ourselves. And this is something I will dive deeply into in the course, the masterclass. When we understand what we uniquely need, because it will be different for all of us, we then realize these are needs, not wants. Do you need more time alone regularly? Do you need more time with people regularly? So it, it could go both ways and it's going to be in varying amounts based on who you uniquely are. Do you need more sleep? Maybe on this night, you need a lot more sleep and you've got to give it to yourself. That is a number one priority. Do you need to take more time where you don't have to do anything? Because you're, you're, you're becoming that grumbly grouch that you don't like becoming. And you might be at this moment in your life blaming it on so many other factors, but at the heart of it is you. It might take some time to change the factors as to why, you, why you're doing what you're doing that isn't working for you. It may not just be, happen in one conversation to your boss or, or with your partner or your children. It might take time, but at least you know, okay, this is what I need to start to change. Okay. And, and I want to go quickly to that point about stopping the criticism. And I share this because I do this too, and I'm getting better at not criticizing myself because I notice now I have more awareness now that when I criticize myself, there is a negative energy that happens that fills me up and it is not a fun place to reside, even though I'm entirely in my own company and a best friend. If we look at it through that lens, a best friend is not going to criticize someone simply to point out what they've done wrong. That's not helpful. That's not nourishing. We are human. We make mistakes. Okay, you're tired. You're not making good decisions. Stop. Stop. Take a break. Start again tomorrow. Finish it tomorrow. That's okay. Again, we've had many episodes and posts written about how to nourish yourself, how to give yourself self-compassion. So this is a topic that I will share posts and links to so you can fuller explore it. But think about it if it helps you. Think about it in the lens of how would a, a best friend treat their friend? What would they do? What would they say? That's, that's something, if you want to look at it through that lens, if that's helpful, that's a good idea. So that's number two, nourish yourself rather than deplete or criticize yourself. Number three, this one ties in. So I put it back to back because they go hand in hand in many ways. And a little bit of overlap, of course, as well. Number three is practice regular self-care. Quote, doing what makes you feel good about yourself is the opposite of self-indulgence. It doesn't mean gratifying an isolated part of you. It means satisfying your whole self. And this includes the feelings and ties and responsibilities you have to others. If you don't learn how to take care of yourself, you can never properly care for others. Again, when we look, look at it through that lens, I want to be loving to others. I want to be kind to others. Start with yourself. Start being kind and loving to yourself. This is not self-indulgent, as the quote says. This is not selfish. I've used the phrase self-full. That's something my own counselor has, has shown me to use instead. You're self-full. You're nourishing yourself to wellness. And you're maintaining that wellness by practicing regular self-care. I've written a handful of posts and episodes about self-care. I will link those in the show notes. So you can check those out. So that's number three. Practice self-care. It's one way to be your own best friend. Number four, linger longer and savor what is working out, what is going well. Quote, when you do something you are proud of, dwell on it a little, praise yourself for it, relish the experience, take it in. It is up to us to give ourselves recognition. If we wait for it to come from others, we feel resentful when it doesn't. And when it does, we may well reject it. It is not what others say to us that counts. We all love praise, but have you ever noticed how quickly the glow from a compliment wears off? When we compliment ourselves, the glow stays with us. It is still good to hear it from others, but it doesn't matter so much if we have already heard it from ourselves. I appreciated this quote because it really puts the responsibility back on us. It tells us to stop having expectations. Okay, well, I'm doing this so that I can get praise. I'm doing this so I can get compliments. If they come, fabulous, but there's no expectation of it. And it's this idea of practicing celebrating in a way that that we will recognize as 
good for you. Put your name in the box. A way of recognizing yourself. This is, again, treating yourself as your best friend because you are. What would you tell your best friend once they reach that goal, when they had a good moment and they're so happy and they're telling you about it? What would you say? What would you do? Think about it through that lens. We have to believe it first. Even if we receive compliments, if we don't believe that we have done something we're celebrating, then that compliment, as the quote mentions, wears off quickly or doesn't even stick at all. And I like this quote too, because it reminds us to celebrate in a way that is with intention, that is conscious, and that brings awareness to the present moment of what has happened. We don't rush to the next thing. It slows us down to savor. And when we practice connecting the neurons of celebrating and being happy, these neurons like a familiar path. And so they will stick in a a path that is continually returned to in our minds. And if it's a path of happiness, if if it's a path of celebration, of woohoo, things are good, this is a good feeling, it sticks to that. If you're constantly looking for the negative, if you're pointing out what's not working, that becomes a well trod path and it will stick to that. Neurologically, this is something that happens in the mind. So if we wire together the neurons we want, celebration, happy, good moments of joy, of, of contentment, they fire together. They're easy. It's easier for them to connect that dot. But if we don't, it's going to take more practice. And initially it will take more practice if we've been used to doing the up opposite, being the negative, focusing on the negative, complaining, looking at what's not working, always trying to f- find something that needs to be fixed. If we're always looking at something as a problem, and we'll talk about this in a later point, we are actually getting in our own way constantly. And life doesn't trust that we want to actually enjoy our days, enjoy our life. Okay. So that's number four. Linger longer. Savor what works out, what is going well. Make that a regular practice. Even small little things. I mean, by the time I get to the end of the day, if I have accomplished one thing that I knew would be a little difficult, even if it's just something that's petitely difficult, that's not even a word, but petitely difficult, I pat myself on the back. I let myself have a breath. I slow down. I take, I take the time to savor. And that really does deepen the quality of our days. Number five, invest your finite energy wisely. Quote, instead of convincing ourselves beforehand that something we want to do is impossible, we should spend those energies looking for ways to do it. That's what growth is doing things you've never done before, sometimes things you once didn't even dream you could. So where we invest, we create. Where we invest, we create opportunities. If we want to spend our energy with our thoughts and our words of saying, I can't do this, this is not possible, and worrying about it, we create that opportunity to happen more likely than it to actually work out. Because If you look at it through an outsider's perspective, and I keep hearing my best friends say, I can't do this, this is going to be difficult, it's going to be hard. They may want to keep cheering you up and supporting you, but if you are determined to tell people it's not going to work out, then why would you support someone who doesn't even believe in themselves? By saying, I can do this, I will figure out a way, even if you don't know, and most of us will not know how to do it. That's why we want to do this thing, right? It hasn't happened in our lives yet. Then that energy is it's magnetic. It may not happen in a way that you expected. It probably won't. It likely won't happen in the time frame you had hoped. But if it comes from a place of sincerity with, within you, that is magnetic and that is energy well spent. So invest your finite energy wisely. That's number five. Number six, it relinquish self-imposed limits. And this ties in to number five um, very nicely. Quote, when you don't set limits on your efforts, great things can come out of them. Can is the verb of choice here. Can come out of it. Because there's no guarantees and we don't exactly know what's going to cross our path. But if we aren't setting limits, we're not putting fences up or borders or boundaries 
we have a wider perspective, an open mind of seeing all the opportunities that may cross our path. And if we listen to ourselves and pay attention to where our curiosity is drawn, we will discover things we never thought possible, but with the clarity of knowing ourselves, of understanding what lights us up, what nourishes us, what, what we're curious about, we will go in that direction that is in line with our true self. And ultimately, it will lead to all sorts of things that elevate the quality of our life, including finding our dharma. So that's number six, relinquish self-imposed limits. Number seven, embrace and honor your genuine also known as true self, quote, when we use our willpower to achieve goals that do not spring out of us, but which we set for the sake of pleasing others or to fulfill a fantasy about who we are, we create a kind of monster, a mechanical man in which our living self is trapped. People who are held together by sheer willpower aren't people we enjoy being around or who enjoy being with themselves. I, so they, they, they explore this one in depth in the book and, um, it's worth talking about for a moment because we do create kind of a monster within, we don't, don't kind of create, we do create a monster within ourselves if we pursue a path that is not ours, but it's trying to please a parent, a society, a culture to gain the praise because we've followed and connected the dots like we're supposed to. I put air quotes around that. We don't become someone who loves their life. We become someone who's constantly trying to prove something or demonstrate something or gain something from the outside world, but they're not at peace with themselves. So when you find peace within yourself, it's because you're honoring your true self and you're not doing it for accolades. You're not doing it for fame. You're not doing it for anything that the outside world can give you. Those things may come. They may not. It doesn't matter. Your job is to honor your true self, take the time to do so, to understand who that is, and then courageously pursue that. But along the journey, that will be just as joy-filled as reaching anything that you, that you accomplish along the way, because you are enjoying what you are doing. doesn't mean it's not going to be challenging at times, but there is an energy within you that is innate. It comes from you not a nudge from the outside world. Okay, that's number seven. Embrace and honor your genuine and true self. Number eight, let go of past grievances. Quote, as long as you spend your energies being angry at the people who deprived you once, you won't spend your effort on getting for yourself what you need now. Life lies in another direction. It lies in letting go, in giving up your grievances. What they are saying they are acknowledging that you likely were aggrieved. You, something horrible happened to you, something, someone treated you poorly. Um, and there's a myriad of things that that could have been. This is not dismissing those. It is not denying that it happened. It is a, a, a letting go and moving forward so that it's not holding you back. It's letting you live the life that wants to be lived if only you would stop remaining in the past. They explore this in depth much more than I will here be with their cycle, uh, with their um, advice and approaches. So I, ex I encourage you to, to read this portion of the book if this speaks to you and it's hard for you to do. Um, and it usually is, <laughs> speaking from experience. Because it's something that we know, and this is something they talk about. We often hang on to this pain, this, this anger, this frustration, because it's what we know. We know how to be angry. We know how to be upset. We have the lines in our head of what they did and how it hurt us. We have that. It's because it's known. And again, the lizard mind likes what it knows. And so to step out of patterns we have been living for years and sometimes decades becomes scary because then we have to live and think differently. And that's new and that's uncomfortable. And it will be um, clumsy as we step into this new way of living that's more joyful and li and more uh, full of happiness. Seems odd that we are, we're, we don't want to step into this more joy-filled, happy life, but ultimately it's the brain, lizard brain saying, I know what this is. At least I know it. I'm going to stay here. But uh, it's kind of like staying um, in an unhealthy relationship, but it's one we 
we are not physically in a relationship with someone in this situation. It's happened in the past. It's over and done with. We're already free from it. Now we have to free our minds. So it's a moving forward that ultimately gives us the freedom to live the life that's waiting to be lived. So that's number eight. All right. I have eight more ways to embrace yourself as your best friend, as well as how this benefits us in our everyday life as we reach it and live a life of fulfillment. Um, but first I have two sponsors I'd like to introduce you to. I'll be right back. How's your sock drawer looking? Scary? Maybe it's time for a spring cleaning and a refresh. Bomba's just dropped a bunch of absurdly soft new socks, tees, and underwear to help you get that drawer in a better place while doing a little good. Once you try Bombas, you'll never look at socks the same way again. They're obsessed over details like foot-hugging honeycomb arch support, anti-blister tabs, and cushioned footbeds that feel like little pillows for your feet. Not to mention buttery soft tees and underwear with no itchy tags. And Bombas has a one purchased equals one donated mission. Every time you buy their socks, tees, or underwear, you also donate essential clothing to someone facing homelessness. To date, Bombas has donated over 100 million clothing items and counting. And they also have the 100% happiness guarantee. So if the dryer or your dog eats a sock, or if you're unhappy with your purchase for virtually any reason, they'll do whatever they can to replace it or make it right. And I can attest, this is true. Nell has chewed up some of my socks when she was puppy. She doesn't do it anymore. And I reached out to them, asked for replacements, and they, without any hesitation or questions, replaced my socks. So grateful. Having Having enjoyed wearing their socks for over four years now, this is a company that is true to their word. Bombas has new garden party socks that bring the party to your feet, which means they have stripes and florals for your sock of choice. New vintage colored rib socks as well, and even a new pointel sock with a frilly cuff for all you frill seekers out there. As a simple, sophisticated listener, get comfy this spring and give back with Bombas. Head over to bombas.com slash sophisticate and use the promo code sophisticate for 20% off your first purchase. That's bombas, B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash sophisticate and use the promo code sophisticate at checkout. All right. I am so excited about this new sponsor. This episode of The Simple Sophisticate is brought to you by Wild Grain, and I am so excited to bring them to your attention because... If you're someone like me who, even if I'm not in France, I love the high quality pastries that remind me of France. The macaroons, the airy light goodness, the subtle sweetness, and the croissants, of course. Well, this is a company to know about. Wild Grain is the first ever bake from frozen subscription box for sourdough breads, fresh pastas, and artisanal pastries. Yes, croissants and macaroons. That's those. Every item bakes from frozen in 15 minutes or less. No thawing required. The team at Wild Grain just sent me a new box and I will confess all the macaroons are gone. <laughs> I've enjoyed one of their pastas, one of their croissants, and I just enjoyed a few slices of their sourdough bread fresh from the oven. All I had to do was stick the frozen loaf in the oven at 450 degrees for 20 minutes. It comes out, the crust is golden brown and crispy and the inside exactly as you want fresh bread from the bakery if you're stepping into the shop. It was delicious. And the, the macaroons were airy and lovely to bite into with a cup of tea for my afternoon treat. And I did, I did substitute their croissants for my croissants this Sunday. And uh-huh, yeah, simple to do. 20 minutes in the oven, straight out of the freezer. Flaky, buttery, and a very good size as well. Oh, I truly, truly enjoyed this box. Um, whew, I have gone through it far too quickly. Um, I still have a few more in my freezer. So I'm pacing myself. Oh, and I had the pasta as well. Just as delicious as you would want from a freshly made pasta. Wonderful. <laughs> so as a simple, sophisticated listener, this is what's awesome. 
you can now fully customize your wild grain box. So you can choose any combination of breads, pastas, and pastries. You can even build a box of only breads or only pastas or only pastries if you're like. So stock up on those croissants. Why not? Plus for a limited time, you can get $30 off that first box plus ooh, ooh, free croissants in every box when you go to wildgrain.com slash simple to start your subscription. You heard me. C'est vrai, free croissants in every box. And $30 off your first box when you go to wildgrain.com slash simple. That's wildgrain.com slash simple. And you can use the promo code simple at checkout to get $30 off. Welcome back. So I'm, I'm going to calm down about the croissants. <laughs> but truly, it was a wonderful box to eat and enjoy. All right, back to our list of how to become your best friend and why it's important to do so. Number nine, recognize and honor the necessity of time alone. Quote, to be abandoned is a terrifying prospect to a child. They literally couldn't survive it. But for an adult, aloneness is something quite different. They not only can survive, they often need aloneness to grow, to get to know themselves and develop their powers. Someone who cannot tolerate aloneness is someone who doesn't know they're grown up. This is something that um, regardless of you, if you are an introvert or not, um, alone time with yourself is a vital time of discovery. And I think that this book helps explain why it's so uncomfortable for so many of us, if not all of us, and I will attest it was uncomfortable um, initially too when I left college, to be completely in my own company, even though this is something I would do often as a child, um, because we are understandably and, and rightfully believing that we to be alone is is we can't do it. We can't, we have to have somebody in our life. We have to have somebody with us at all times. Um, because it's survivalistically, we, we, we need other people. We know this. But as a child, as they point out in the quote, we literally need other people. We cannot survive on our own. And so it takes time to shed what we've lived with for 18 some odd years. All right, maybe, you know, 22 years, whatever it might be. Um, but something we've talked about often here on the blog and on the podcast is how to be in our own company, what benefits we find when we do it. And one such benefit is recognizing what our true voice is, who we truly are, what shoulds have been accepted as truth, but actually are someone else's voice of what we should do or how we should live or who we should be. When we know who we truly are, it becomes much easier to make decisions, but also to be loving to people, even those people that may have influenced us or live a different way and don't understand why we're living the way we want to live now. We can be more loving to them and not passively angry or aggressive or get into unnecessary, completely appearing um, off-topic arguments when really it's a frustration of wanting to be set free by their expectations. But we set ourselves free. This is how we become our best friend. We set ourselves free. We are adults now. <laughs> we, we don't live with our adults. We, our parents, we, 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 we pay our own bills. We have our own job. And so it is our now psychologically responsibility to understand how we may still be connected or, or be emotionally reliant on our parents or other people um, in whatever way that might have, have, have arisen for us in our lives. So here's another quote to ponder. What fresh air we breathe when we take possession of our own separateness from approval of our parents psychologically and literally for some. Our own integrity. That's when our adult life really begins. So number nine is to recognize and honor the necessity of time alone. Number 10, I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into this, this relationship that we often still hang on to with our parents that is actually holding us back from number one, being our own best friend, but also living the life that is waiting for us to live that will bring us deep and fulfilling true contentment. Number 10, understand what fully being grown up requires. Quote, you have to live through those feelings of discomfort or guilt for living our life without approval from our parents or caregivers. 
if you ever want to grow up completely. What you're letting go of is your fear of them and their power over you. In a very ruthless, primitive way, you have to choose yourself over them. If you go on subordinating your needs and impulses and wishes to theirs, you will never come into your own. This is so necessary and powerful. And if you are a parent, also something to listen to with regards to your own children, if they are adults, or even if they're not adults yet. As a parent, what they are writing about, and they dive into this more fully in the book, so I encourage you to explore it, is the responsibility of a parent is there to be there for their kid when they are children. But once your child has the courage and the strength to live and be their own person, this is where you pat yourself on the back and you let go. I can remember a time when someone said, you mean you're not a w worried about getting approval from your parents? And I was in my late 20s when I heard this from an adult human being. And I was looking at them going, I need to approve of my life first. This is not about getting my parents approval. And what was just so powerful to me was just how uh, like a dart, it went into my, my awareness that if I lived to get approval from my parents, I was not living. I knew and felt that in that moment. But this was an adult person truly believing that the approval from my parents had to be met in all that I did. Our, our parents are people. They, they are just people. And we can be grateful if they gave us a loving and secure childhood because that is something we have no control over as a child. We are at the mercy of that situation. The parents are people. They are not perfect. And when we stop living our life to please them, to also to have them as a backup, we set ourselves free. We are giving ourselves more responsibility and it will take time and be uncomfortable because it hasn't been something we've done before. But we are opening up a world of discovery that will lead us to what fulfillment will be for us. So that's number 10. Again, they explore it more in the book. I encourage you to check it out because if you are someone who struggles with your relationship with parents, and I don't mean that as you have a bad relationship with your parents, even if you have a loving relationship with your parents and you love them very much and vice versa, there is still sometimes a confusion as to when you're an adult, how to have the healthy relationship. And again, it takes two people, but your part of this is to set yourself free and be an adult. It doesn't mean you're saying, I don't love you. It doesn't mean you, you're not saying thank you, but you have to be an adult and live the life that, that is unique to you, whether they approve or not. All right. Number 11, make friends with the present moment. So I included um, in this point passages from Eckhart Tolle's New Earth because I was rereading that book recently as I was reading How to Be Your Own Best Friend. And this point was so powerful to me as to an aha of how we get in our own way, how we're not being our own best friend, that I felt it was a wonderful marriage here in this episode. So number 11 is how to be our own best friend is to make friends with the present moment because how we treat the present moment is very much akin to how we treat our own best friend. So how are we going to treat the present moment? Quote, become friendly toward it. Welcome it no matter in what disguise it comes and soon you will see the results. Life becomes friendly toward you. People become helpful. Circumstances cooperative. One decision changes your entire reality. So this was a huge aha for me, um, which is why I wanted to share it. We, as I shared in a Monday motivational post uh, last week, we are the dance and life engages with us. So how we choose to engage with life will determine the quality of our life. And that's something he also talked about in the new earth. 
And often we hear about life as a dance and we need to just get in the dance and start, you know, living. But it's reverse, actually. Life is going to engage with us based on the dance we present to it, meaning the thoughts, the actions, the choices, the engagement. So the engagement with regards to this quote or this point, number 11, make friends with the present moment, is how do you view the present moment? If the present moment is an obstacle for you to get by so you can get to tomorrow, get to next year, get to the end of the school year, get to the end of the work week, then you are not befriending the present moment. Quote, the decision to make the present moment into your friend is the end of the ego. So often, and the ego is a hard little guy to understand. I don't even want to call it a guy. I just want to call it an entity because it's within us. But once we understand how the ego presents itself, it is deathly afraid of the, the present moment. And once we befriend the present moment, we see the end of the ego. Quote, if your relationship with the now or the present is dysfunctional, meaning you're constantly fighting, you're constantly wanting to get past it, beyond it, that dysfunction will be reflected in every relationship and every situation you encounter. Here's another quote to ponder. When the present moment is regarded and treated as if it were an obstacle to overcome, this is where impatience frustration, and stress arise. As you reflect on your own life, right now, today, tomorrow, yesterday, whatever, I, it would be best obviously to look in the past, not tomorrow. And if you're constantly in a state of, well, when this happens, I'll be happy. When I reach this point, I'll be happy. I just have to get past today's workload and I'll be happy then you are seeing the present moment as an obstacle. And if we, quote, as long as the present moment is seen as an obstacle to, un to overcome in order to be happy, there can be no end to the problems. Within the quote, he provides this conversation, Eckhart Tolle, quote, I'll be whatever you want me to be, says the present moment. I'll treat you the way you treat me. If you see me as a problem, I'll be a problem to you. If you treat me as an obstacle, I'll be an obstacle, end quote. So this is why if you view the present moment fully as it is and you dance and you fully engage, the energy you bring to that space, those decisions you make to engage fully in that present moment will then create the reality that you that you seek that you desire that you want to have happen but if you're constantly battling the present moment it doesn't know what you want because it doesn't trust you'll know how to appreciate it when it does arrive if it is good this was a lovely conversation he talks about and if you have the book i'll give you the page number it starts on 199 and 200 um, says the ego and the present moment. It's a fantastic exploration into exactly what he's getting at here is if we fight the present moment and we do not make friends with it, we are getting in our own way of, of experiencing happiness and thus contentment because all we have is the present moment. That is all we will ever, ever have. Magically, tomorrow turns into today. All right, so that's number 11. Number 12, understand the paradox of seizing opportunities when presented. Quote, there is more than enough to go around. Developing our human resources doesn't use them up. It only enlarges our possibilities. And those resources do not keep. If you do not mind them now, they are lost forever. So once you know who you are, you're engaging with the present moment, you've befriended it. Um, you're daring to do things anew, letting go of grievances, um, making choices that, you know, tickle your curiosity, even though you don't know how it's going to turn out. Um, that is you seizing opportunity. If you wait for everything to be perfect, that chance likely will not hang around and wait for you because nothing will ever be perfect. It doesn't mean you jump before things are thought through, but you can't wait for guarantees. It also, if you're holding back because you're afraid that, oh, I'm taking too much, that's, I'm too full of myself for thinking that's possible. There is more than enough to go around. And in fact, you chasing that dream and going after what it is that you uniquely are drawn to is going to inspire others to do the same in their life. And their journey is going to be unique to them. So 
A reminder in the book is there are no limits to how much we can grow and develop, but time limits us. When we're healthy and young, we sometimes forget. Not always. Sometimes some of us sadly have been reminded of this far too early in our lives, that life is not forever. Okay, things cross our path for a reason. It doesn't mean you jump on everything. Knowledge is power here about yourself. You can appreciate something and say, no, thank you. But and doesn't mean it's going to work out if you seize it, but it'll likely teach you something that will be invaluable to the next step you take. And that's all you can do is take the next best step. That's all you can do. So um, appreciate, celebrate these opportunities when they, they cross your path. If you can't stop thinking about it, it might be a sign that you need to explore it further. That's number 12. Understand the paradox of seizing opportunities when presented. Number 13, choose to grow. In other words, embrace a growth mindset and understand what it entails to do so. Quote, genuine growth means having the courage and confidence to try new things and in the process to let go of old ones. But you move on because it's more interesting and exciting to take on new challenges. You may be scared too, but you're also attracted. This doesn't mean you have to despise the self you were. You let go of what you don't need anymore because you are on to something better. The only way we grow is by being in dynamic motion. It doesn't mean we have to constantly be doing. We've talked about this before. Being is a, is a vitally important regular thing to do as well. And I know that's a a conflict of terms there, doing and being. But the idea is that in order to grow, things are going to have to be done differently. If you don't like the way something is unfolding or working out or revealing itself to be, doing the same thing will likely produce the same results. And since we've never done something before, it's going to be uncomfortable temporarily. When we know this beforehand, it's easier to take that first step. We've talked about this many, many times in the blog and the podcast. Um, but the idea to grow rather than stay stagnant is what is going to give us life and provide opportunity for those opportunities to cross our path. That's number 13. Choose to grow, understanding what it entails. 14. Let go of unseen pressures and be your full self. Quote, but if you have the courage to endure that wrench and that awareness, it will pave the way for something far better than the childlike dependence you gave up. The true intimacy that is only possible between equals, between adults. That's when the fun really begins, when people are in full possession of themselves, when they really know who they are and are who they are. That's when they can really open up themselves to others. So this is another um, reference to letting go of pleasing your parents or caregivers and daring once you figure out who you are or who it is that, you know, what, what brings you to life to fully embrace that, to be courageous enough to do that. That is when you open up the possibility of meeting and connecting with people, platonic, romantic, that will really elevate the quality of your life in ways you could not have done if you hadn't have let go. There is, as this phrase says, there is true intimacy that is found only between equals, between secure adults. And that's when life really starts to come alive. So embracing your full self, letting yourself be free, and then letting go to see who and what you um, connect with or what crosses your path. Number 15, know yourself and live genuinely and you will give yourself a life to love every single day. Quote, when we begin to make available to ourselves our own possibilities, it's like drilling a well to an untapped energy reserve, like finding a bank account we haven't yet used. You never run out of enjoyment of life. You are never bored. It is also old age security. When we befriend ourselves, when we realize we are our own best friend, we have given ourselves an amazing ingredient that will maintain that enjoyment of life the rest of our lives. We have had it within us this entire time. We can't control so many things outside of us, but we can control how we use the amazing gifts that are within us. 
And these gifts are partly just the awareness of what we can do to comfort ourselves, to nourish ourselves that are healthy, that are kind, that bring us calm and peace. So when we know ourselves and live genuinely, so we live honoring our true selves, we give ourselves a life to love every single day. That's number 15. Last but not least, and it ties into number 15, a true friend for life's entire journey is who you will find when you befriend yourself. Quote, we can all help ourselves to change, to grow, to become the person it is in us to be. We can learn to be our own best friend. If we do, we have a friend for life. We are our own best source of encouragement and good advice. We are all accustomed to waiting for someone to give us a kind word, but we already have available to ourselves many kind words. When we realize this, truly, truly understand this, and then go through the journey of getting to know ourselves courageously start to let go of those things that have been holding us in someone else's life journey or expectations of us, setting ourselves free, you'll be thankful to your best friend for giving you this awesome gift. And thus you'll be thanking yourself. And you'll be someone who is, is at ease with, with their life. So therefore you, you, you give this ease of being when you're around other people as well. And that's an energy that's lovely to be around. We don't know how our presence or our engagement will affect others, but we can be at peace. Our conscious can rest knowing that we are not fighting something because now we know how to figure out what it is that is unsettling us. Likely it's because we haven't let something go that's holding us back or someone's approval go. You don't have to let go of the relationship of your parents or your caregivers, but you do need to let go of seeking their approval. You you likely have felt guilt for thinking of even doing that if you haven't done so already. That's natural, but it's also because you're still in the old mindset of a child. You're an adult now. You can let go. And I say this to you as I've had to say it to myself before. This journey took time to get to. It was not easy, especially when you love your parents, as I do. But you give the world something it needs when you tap into who you truly are. And when people who love you, and this includes your parents, see you light up, see you happy, see you contributing to the world, but also feeling nourished and alive, That's when it becomes clear that this was a really wise decision to make. Be your own best friend. All right. So yet again, simplicity comes the forefront of our lives when it comes to knowing how to live well. We often do get in our own way, and I don't want us to blame ourselves for that. We've never been given a handbook. We do not come out of the womb knowing how to live well. These are skills. We have to learn them. Someone has to teach them to us, or we seek out someone who knows this information. And this book does provide um, definitely some insight in how to do that. If we errantly assume that living well requires us to find something outside of ourselves, we are expending unnecessary energy trying to find something that is already within us. The wonderful news I hope you've discovered today by listening to this episode is that you have the ahas within you when you know what you were looking for and how to apply them in your everyday life. So I will link the book on the show notes, the simply luxurious life.com slash podcast 379. And uh, I'll be back with this week's Petit Plaisir. Simple Sophisticate is also sponsored by Vessi. At Vessi, they're all about embracing every weather, but this summer, they're taking it up a notch. Born from a love for the outdoors, Vessi footwear is designed to help you step confidently into any adventure from sun-soaked streets to unexpected summer showers. And with summer comes warmth, but it also brings surprises. With Vessi, get ready to enjoy the summer season to its fullest, no matter what it throws your way. Embracing every splash with Vessi's technology ensures you stay cool, comfortable, and stylish, from city walks to beach escapes. 
Their weekend sneaker is ideal for any and every activity. Whether it's a beach day, a city adventure, or a casual hangout, the weekend sneaker is all about versatility and comfort. And their Stormburst Low Top is one that will prepare you for those sudden summer showers or slushy puddles <laughs> that pop up in the middle of your walk. The Stormburst comes with excellent grip and a like that and ensures you're prepared for those unpredictable slushy surprises on your summer explorations. As someone who goes on a lot of walks and with the weather always changing here in Bend, yes, we get those out of the blue summer rain showers. I have been enjoying wearing Vessi shoes on my walks with the pups. They are super comfortable and quite light and they do get a lot of great traction. So there's no slipping or sliding. Um, I highly recommend these if you're looking for a quality made shoe that lets your foot breathe, as well as when you tailor the shoe to the type of walks you go on, it will make sure your foot is dry, but also comfortable and enables you to just thoroughly enjoy what and where you are going. So let's talk about their weekend sneaker for a moment. Ideal for unpredictable weather, this will also take you from a casual workday to a weekend adventure, and the versatility of the weekend sneaker ensures a seamless transition. With a range of colors and styles, the weekend sneakers are not just about practicality, but also about expressing your personal style without sacrificing comfort or protection against the elements. What I love about these is the lightweight feature and their breathable design that makes these sneakers a joy to wear all day. From morning walk to evening strolls, which is what we do each day, <laughs> your feet remain cozy and dry. Elevate your summer activities with Vessi Stormburst and Weekend Shoes. Discover more at Vessi.com slash sophisticate. And when you get your pair today, get an automatic 15% off your first purchase at checkout. That's Vessi.com slash sophisticate, V-E-S-S-I dot com slash sophisticate. And be ready to stay cool and dry. The Simple Sophisticate is also sponsored by Indeed. Is hiring a challenge? Yes. Do you love a challenge? Also, yes, then you need a hiring partner that can help you rise to that challenge. You need Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites searching for candidates with the right skills, Indeed's powerful hiring platform can help you do it all. They streamline hiring with powerful tools that find you matched candidates. And with Instant Match, over 80% of employers get quality candidates whose resumes on Indeed match their job description the moment they sponsor a job, according to Indeed Data US. Now, if I'm looking for a contractor to work on my website or to work on anything that I need to delegate, either I don't know how to do it or I can't do it well, Indeed provides the opportunity to find who I need quickly and assuredly. Candidates you invite to apply are three times more likely to apply to your job than candidates who only see it in search, according to US Indeed data. And they get you one step closer to the hire by immediately matching you with quality candidates. Indeed does the hard work for you and shows you candidates whose resumes on Indeed fit your description immediately after you post so you can hire faster and complete your job on schedule. And even better, Indeed's the only job site where you only pay for applications that meet your must-have requirements. Indeed is an unbelievably powerful hiring platform, delivering four times more hires than all other job sites combined, according to Talent Nest 2019. Join more than 3 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash simple. Offer good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit now at Indeed.com slash simple. Just go to Indeed.com slash simple and support this show by saying you heard about it on the Simple Sophisticate podcast. That's Indeed.com slash simple terms and conditions apply need to hire you need indeed all right so this week's petit plaisir is one in which the series actually hasn't been completely finished but i've had the opportunity to watch the first three episodes and i wanted to recommend that you watch the series franklin on Apple's TV Plus platform. Now, I will, I'm gonna give a lot of caveats here because I 
I don't think it's an absolutely 10 out of 10 series, at least not yet. And from the reviews I've read, most reviewers are giving it um, the quality, uh, trusted reviewers are giving it between a three and a four. Um, I would give it a high three out of five. Um, but here's why I think this audience would thoroughly enjoy it. Yes, it is located and entirely filmed in France. So you have all these beautiful backdrops. The Palace of Versailles, they filmed there on the Place des Hommes. They film in Passy, which is, as many of you know, um, part of the 16th arrondissement in Paris. Um, so on the outer edges of Paris. Um, and they film in Paris. There is a scene where the young grandson Temple is running through the Palais des... Um, uh, Palais de uh, Royale through the corridors um, and you see the black iron fence with the gold tips on top and, and I'm sitting there watching this going, oh my gosh, I've been there. I've walked right where he's running. <laughs> um, so it's all filmed in France. And as many know, Michael Douglas stars as Benjamin Franklin uh, as we are in the middle of the American Revolution and in Paris and in France specifically, leading up to their soon to come revolution. And I am really liking this. It is a, a, a series that will include eight episodes. And they began filming in June 2022. So almost two years ago. And it took them seven weeks, just over 80 days of filming. Let me just walk you through what I'm enjoying about this. First of all, this is a series that is based on a book written by a Pulitzer Prize winning author. So it's written or it's based on Stacey Schiff's book that was published in 2005, A Great Improvisation, Franklin, France and the Birth of America. Now, I have ordered this book. I cannot wait to read through it. I love reading about history. And you tie in France and I'm all ears. So I am actually going to be diving into this book. It's over 500 pages long. And as I mentioned, she has won a Pulitzer Prize, but it entirely focuses on this particular tenuous period that was never guaranteed. And Benjamin Franklin was not an official diplomat. I mean, this is a new thing he is doing. He has never been someone who was uh, communicating with other countries. He was known for, as the Parisians at this time thought, he created electricity. As we know, I mean, obviously he didn't create it, he just learned about it and spread the word. He became well known for so many other things. And then on the eve of the revolution and then leading up to the revolution, he becomes a founding father and is a major figure um, that, as we know from history, has great success, but it was never guaranteed. And in fact, if it didn't work out, he would have been hung just like the rest of the founders by Britain. So um, what's lovely about this is Michael Douglas, speaks French, but not always. It's not beautiful French, but it's knowledgeable French. It's very honest in that sense, I find, to what an American who has spent time in France before, Benjamin Franklin had spent time in France before when he was younger and loved it, um, which is part of the reason why he knows how to speak French, but they're not pretending he's this fluent, erudite Parisian who knows all the nuances of the French language, but he does know the language. He's respectful, as you would imagine, of a diplomat in his communications. And um, they do try to have as much French spoken on the screen as possible. This is not, um, as other series have been that are set in France, entirely in English, but set in France. This is set in France, and you have the French speaking French to each other. So there's subtitles. You have the French speaking French sometimes to Benjamin Franklin and him speaking back in French. He also goes back in English and then they speak to him in English too when they're talking about more complex topics. And you have his young grandson who's 17, Temple, learning the French language as he goes. Through each episode, you can see him learning more and he becomes more at ease with speaking French with each of the three episodes, which is very honest about how it would happen if you were spending time in France. You come not knowing anything. You come kind of looking at them going, what did you just say? And then them helping you out speaking French and vice versa. Anyway, so it's a lovely, um, basically a subplot and main plot. You have Benjamin Franklin trying to get France to support uh, the States and also this relationship with his grandson um, and him raising him in the sense of him becoming a man, be growing up, 
and also enjoying and loving what France has to offer at the age of 17, of a young boy of age of 17. Um, anyway, so Michael Douglas is so well known as Michael Douglas, right? We've known him and seen him on screen for over 50 years. It's so hard not to see just Michael Douglas when you're watching this, but instead Ben Franklin. And I don't think that's the point. He is the same age as who, as what Ben Franklin was at this point in history. He um, was 70, I believe, when he taped it. And Franklin was 73 when this happened or when it began. So it's very accurate to that. Likely not the health status would be the same as we would imagine. (laughs) But anyway, and to quickly talk about the French cast. So if you've watched a lot of French television shows, you're going to recognize quite a few faces in the main characters. So the lead actress that plays Benjamin Franklin's, I wouldn't say love interest, but his his paramour um, in many ways um, is Ludovine Seigneur. And you will immediately recognize her face, but you may be trying to place her like I was because she's wearing all these fancy wigs as they did during that time. This is the woman who played Lupin's wife in the series Lupin on Netflix. I absolutely adore her in this role, and I thoroughly enjoyed her in Lupin. Um, And uh, when you see her face, I know you'll be like, oh, I do recognize her. And then you have uh, Thibault uh, de Montem, <laughs> I apologize for the pronunciation here, Montem Imbert, and he was on 10% or Call Your Agent. So you'll recognize him. He plays uh, Comte de Verge, and he plays a significant role in this series as well. And last but not least, for Anglophiles, you're going to recognize Tom Hughes, who was Prince Albert in the series uh, Victoria. He plays, and I'm not giving anything away here, a very malicious character. His face is so recognizable. I had to remind myself, who is this person? I recognize him. Um, But over um, all, this is a a French um, uh, script in the sense of they're going to try to bring you as much French spoken language and lines as they possibly can. And they do, I think, a very good job of that. That's appreciated. Some people have said they don't like the dark setting or the scenes of how it's filmed. And when you listen or read interviews with the director, the reason he did this was it's all about the tone he's trying to create. And if you know anything about history, which I know you all do, as I just said, we are on the eve of the French Revolution. And we are obviously in a very tenuous time with regards to the French and American relationship. And so while you have this gallantry and this beauty of of the aristocracy in France and Paris and Versailles specifically at this time, you also have it have it being on the precipice of coming to an end. And so knowing that as viewers, he places us in this setting that's a bit gloomy, but at the same time quite mysterious. Roger Ebert praised Michael Douglas's role uh, and presentation of Benjamin Franklin and said they should pay more attention to that particular plot of the diplomacy and the relationship rather than the grandson-grandfather um, plot. Not that it's not important because it is a big part of the book, um, but it actually takes away from the tension and the stress of the main plot. And to some degree, I agree. I mean, if you're looking for a drama that's not historical based, you're going to want to follow the temple story. But as someone who wants to watch the historical un- story unfold, get into the politics of it all, and and how this was a dance that was never guaranteed, it was a seduction in so many ways, but at the same time, nothing was assured that's what I want to watch more of. Um, and those scenes are my favorite. Um, I, I really love um, how Benjamin Franklin dives into this, you know, using his intelligence, but also remaining respectful, realizing there may be spies amongst him, but not trying to call them out because he's not quite sure. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a lovely uh, historical tell, telling um, at the same time, a beautiful setting. As I said, they filmed the entire thing in France. And I look forward to watching the remaining seven episodes. A new episode airs every Friday on Apple TV+. Plus. And um, I think as a Francophile, you will quite enjoy this. The, the, the clothing, the setting, the buildings, the architecture, the decor. I mean, it's all, it's the real deal. 
and they had to dress all those extras as the director and writer said um, or the adapt who adapted this to to the screen said this was not easy to do but it felt like a magical day every single day because of all that they were able to do all right the series is titled franklin as i mentioned and i will be watching this friday and maybe you will be as well I hope you've enjoyed this week's Petit Plaisir, where each week ideas are shared to make the everyday all the more enjoyable. Tune in at the end of each episode where I'll recommend a book, a film, a show, a recipe, anything that is a simple pleasure to satiate your sophisticated taste. As we wrap up this week, the uh, next episode will be on the 1st of May. And I actually have three new episodes in May coming for you because next month is British Week on the blog, the sixth annual British Week. But I wanted to remind you that the once a year membership sale is coming up starting tomorrow, the 18th, and it only runs for four days. And this year, for the first time since we've been doing this, I'm including the basic membership in the sale. So all of the memberships, top tier, monthly, quarterly, yearly, are going to be um, on sale. It's a permanent savings. So last year, um, the reduction was, I believe, 10%. And it may not seem like a lot, but if you're paying this every single month or quarter or year, you're continually saving that, 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 um, you're continually saving that amount and you will never, ever lose it if you keep active. And remember, you can remain active and pause it every once in a while based on your budget needs and keep that price. So if you are interested in reading as many posts as you want, so British week, I said, is coming up. French week is in August. Um, simply the basic one is a great one to explore because it means you, um, can read as many posts as you want. Um, you don't get the access to exclusive content, but you also don't have to pay that price for the exclusive access. Um, but if you do become a top tier member, it's a good idea to do it now because in June, when the Contentment Masterclass launches, you'll receive 20% off that price if you purchase it within the first month. So it's gonna become available in June. I'll have more details released in May, specifically when it comes available you'll receive 20% off the price. You can have it for as long as you want. It's a, a lifetime class. You only pay once. And uh, as long as you purchase it within the first month, and that's only if you're a top tier member that's active. So unpaused. So you are an active, active member. Okay. Anyway, again, that once a year membership sale on the Simply Luxurious Life for basic and top tier membership begin tomorrow, the 18th, and runs through the 21st. I'll be sharing the promo code in the weekly and monthly newsletters. So if you're subscribed to those lists, that's what they'll be coming. And you don't want to miss out. I'll provide the link on the show notes so you can sign up. All right. And now to the rest of our Wednesday or whatever day of the week you're tuning in. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you very much for tuning in. Until May 1st, I'll see you on the blog. Bonjour. Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. For more ideas and inspiration throughout the week, visit the blog, The Simply Luxurious Life, with the shortened URL, tsll.co, or thesimplyluxuriouslife.com. For more in-depth exploration of how to cultivate your own unique, simply luxurious life, pick up my new book, which became both a bestseller and number one new release in France Travel, The Road to Le Papillon, Daily Meditations on True Contentment, available in all four formats for your preferred reading or listening. My first book, titled Choosing the Simply Luxurious Life, and my second book, Living the Simply Luxurious Life, are also available in each of the four formats. Readers can now join the more intimate the Simply Luxurious Life international community by becoming members of the blog, which offers the benefits of ad-free reading site-wide, unlimited access and exclusive access to content on the blog, such as the monthly A Couple Moments with Shannon video chat, tours of my home Le Papillon, the monthly What Made Me Smile post, and monthly Ponderings post, as well as the exclusive opportunity to enter all of the giveaways during the annual French and British weeks. To stay caught up on all things Simply Luxurious, the podcast, blog post, the cooking show, and receive exclusive news, as well as an extra dose of inspiration to jumpstart each new month, subscribe to the Simply Luxurious Live's free monthly newsletter, arriving on the last day of each month in your inbox. 
There is also a weekly newsletter, which is also free, and arrives each Friday to keep you caught up on the recent weekly posts on the blog. Enjoy with a hot cuppa or cup of morning coffee and stay in the know about all things Simply Luxurious. Look for two new episodes of this podcast on the first and third Wednesday of each month. And until next time, I'm your host, Shannon Abels. Thank you for tuning in. Bonjour. Thank you.